This presentation is part of the academic webinar series of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. To view a full catalog of our past presentations and for a schedule of our upcoming webinars, please visit nonviolent-conflict.org and click on the Learning and Resources tab. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict academic webinar series. My name is Jake Fitzpatrick and I'm the Content Development Associate at ICNC. And today's webinar is titled The Effect of Nonviolent Palestinian Protests on Israeli Perceptions of the Conflict and will be delivered by Nicole Argo. Nicole Argo is new to the study of nonviolent resistance, coming instead from a background in war, insurgency, and intergroup dynamics. She's one of the few experts on political resistance and rebellion that has spoken and lived with militants. Her interest is in understanding motivations. Through ethnog ethnography and surveys, her work shows that non-militants and militants and non-militants alike are often more concerned about the process of a conflict than its outcome, focusing on dignity and justice as much as strategic ends. In her interviews, pro-social intergroup emotions often motivated willingness to engage in fighting, as well as costly nonviolent resistance. Nicole has published peer-reviewed articles and chapters in top publications, as well as policy and cultural magazines such as MIT's Audits of Conventional Wisdom, The Chronicle of Higher Education, The Jerusalem Post, and Bomb Magazine. In addition to academic work and and popular writing, Nicole has consulted with governments, media groups, and policy think tanks such as the U.S. Department of Defense, Exclusive Analysis, Monitor Group, and the Alliance of Civilizations Media Fund. Nicole has an MA in International Policy Studies from Stanford University. Her doctorate in Social Psychology will be from the New School for Social Research. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Nicole. Thank you, Jake, um, for inviting me to present and also in general for your role in bringing the webinar to the public. It seems like there's a really impressive range of expertise brought to bear and, um, and made available to the public here, which is, I think, incredibly important. So I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, today, I want to share findings from a recent survey designed by my colleague Jeremy Gingas and I. I should state at the outset that this will be our first presentation on the data. And I know that this audience has a lot of knowledge on the topic, so I'm looking forward to brainstorming about it with you all at the end. Um, so first, let me start by giving a very brief background on nonviolent resistance in the Palestinian territories. Um, there is actually a long history of nonviolent struggle, extending back before Balfour through the first and second intifadas. Um, here's just a picture of uh, rallies and protests, which were the bread and butter of resistance to an increasing Jewish presence and power um, before Balfour. They were usually put down by the British, um, but references to violence also exist uh, during that time, and they're also accurate. These were usually uh, skirmishes, very local skirmishes between new settlers and existing landowners, so the majority of campaigning was nonviolent uh, resistance. And while violent rebellion garnered most of the media attention during the first and second intifada, some have estimated that 75 to 90 percent of resistant activities during those times were actually nonviolent in nature. Um, Brian Barber includes a list of almost 100 uh, activities, which range from visiting injured people in the hospital to hanging posters to um, providing water for people during times of siege, pretty much anything in daily life that was pro-social for the group uh, that wasn't actually, you know, throwing stones or, or uh, responding violently to Israeli soldiers. Importantly, many Palestinians believe that just remaining under an occupation is a form of resistance, so daily life itself. And this is an especially relevant argument today in places like Jerusalem where there have been documented efforts to, to drive them out. So nonviolence or nonviolent resistance has been a longstanding strategy um, for Palestinians. After the Second Intifada, uh, there were some specific tactics that may seem familiar to you all. These include participation by the entire population, such as in the case of the old women who would encircle a building targeted for assassination so that the IDF would not strike. 
Um, there's been a recent hunger strike by Palestinian within Israeli prison, which led to his successful release. And one of the largest Palestinian marches took place this past year in remembrance of the Nakba. Uh, here's a photo of that. Actually, I should, uh, I should state that I just realized I had not credited all these photos yet, so the official presentation that goes online um, after we're done here will have the photos credited. Apologies for that. Um, the example that we used in our study, uh, the example of nonviolence, we took from protests that have consistently gone on this past decade against the construction of the security fence. These happen in places like Budras and Bielin, as well as others, where villages, uh, a tremendous number, a percentage of the village, participated in protests um, at the wall on a weekly or daily basis, often partnering with Israelis and often at great personal sacrifice. So to that end, I mean that there have been many injuries and at least two deaths. Um, here's a few images from some of these protests. Uh, they can get quite creative. This was a picture from uh, Bielin in 2011, where they dressed as a Navi from Avatar. And then here's a picture of the women in Budris. Probably many of the participants in this webinar have, are aware of or have seen um, Just Vision's documentary, Budris, and the women played a very special role in, in that resistance. So, um, given the consistency of these protests, despite their limited press in Israel, we knew that Israelis were aware of them. Indeed, many credit the protests with, prompt, with prompting the Israeli Supreme Court to order rerouting of the fence. So our question was, how might the introduction of nonviolent protests change the ways, or the introduction of sort of an organizing, consistent nonviolent protest um, that people were aware of on a regular basis in Israel, change the ways that Israelis view the conflict? So we came up with a few ideas. Um, one was that it would show Israelis that there were partners for peace among the Palestinians, and that not all Palestinians supported violent tactics. Another was that it would lead to more optimism about prospects for peace, so it would practically influence how people thought about solving the conflict. Another was that it might decrease vigilance surrounding sacred values, and sacred values in psychological um, terms are those values which we will not trade off on. So in particular, as an example, uh, if you have a child and I offered you money for your child, uh, you'd say no. If I did it again, you might even hit me because you don't value your child in monetary terms. Uh, so again, sacred values are things that we don't trade off on. And we had an idea that um, because sacred values have been shown to increase in number and rigidity under threat, in intergroup threat, that perhaps by uh, reminding people of nonviolent protests, we would find a decrease in the numbers of people who espouse sacred values related to the conflict. Um, and then we also thought that that nonviolent resistance might lead to more optimistic assessments of what Palestinians think and how they would react to Israeli political moves. Um, again, these ideas corresponded to some psychological concepts that we thought were worth testing. The first one was um, about group behavior. There's something called entitativity in psychology where people often see outgroups as one entity rather than variations of different perspectives. And we wanted to see if this existed um, or if it was changed by the introduction of nonviolent resistance. Um, in terms of optimism about prospects for peace, we have some questionnaires that we've used in the past that looked at willingness to make trade-offs for a peace agreement. And in terms of decreasing vigilance around sacred values, uh, we have some traditional sacred values questionnaires that we have used in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, and then in terms of assessments of how Palestinians think and would react to political moves, um, there are a bunch of questions of theory of mind that we decided to use for the survey. Theory of mind is just how we think others think. So we developed these survey questions, and I'm going to provide a few examples of them here. In terms of groups, we were interested both if, um, if there would be changes in how people think of groups in general. So are groups, not just Palestinians, but groups, are they uh, things that can change over time, or are, are they deeply essentialized? This is just how you are. And one of the questions that 
um, that we used to gauge this was. Groups that are characterized by extreme and violent behavior will never change because these characteristics are deeply rooted within them. And there were about four questions that looked at that. And then we also wanted to look specifically at Palestinians as groups and whether or not um, Israelis perceived them as uh, varying in perspective um, and being able to change over time. So we asked, here's an example, do you think there are Palestinians who think Israelis should be killed just because they are Jews? If yes, what percentage do you think has this belief? And then there were several other questions that looked at um, more goal-oriented behavior, are Palestinians focused on justice and um, don't want to see any Jews killed, are Palestinians committed to nonviolence, um, things like that. And then in terms of peace optimism and trade-offs, we looked at a question that posed a very general peace agreement. Suppose the United States organized a peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians. And um, I can go through in the questions if you want exactly what we proposed. There were just three elements. It didn't get into too many particulars. We've used this question in the past um, to not ruffle feathers. It's sort of the general majority of both sides um, has at different times said that this was what they would agree to. And then we asked, you know, would you vote for this agreement? There were a variety of other questions looking at um, what would your reaction to a leader who voted for this agreement be? Um, do you think there would be violence within Israel to oppose it? Uh, do you think Palestinians would uh, agree to it, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and then here's another one. Do you think that this agreement could be successfully and peacefully implemented, leading to a real peace? In terms of sacred values, we wanted to look at um, the value of Eretz Israel, so land, giving up land for peace, and also sovereignty, sharing Jerusalem. Um, here was the land question. Do you agree that there are some circumstances where it would be permissible for Israelis to consider giving away part of Eretz Israel? Actually, I noticed a typo. We asked if there are some extreme circumstances where it would be permissible. And the idea here is that if someone says no, period, it's a sacred value because under no condition whatsoever would they consider it. If they say yes or I don't know, then it's not a sacred value. They're willing to consider something. And then lastly, in terms of theory of mind and how Palestinians would react to specific actions taken by Israel, we asked a series of questions, one of which was, imagine Israel unilaterally declared and implemented a freeze on settlement building and dismantled illegal settlement outposts. Do you think Palestinians would see that Israel was serious about taking steps towards peace and would end their support for the violent factions that hurt their cause, such as Hamas? So. Um, so these are examples of the questions, and we'll get into a few more of them later. But first I wanted to um, introduce you to how we manipulated the survey. Um, so psychologists use something called primes sometimes. And basically a prime is just an activation of a knowledge structure, usually implicitly. So you want to do it without people knowing that you're doing it. We wanted to see how activating Israeli knowledge of nonviolent actions by Palestinians affected their perceptions of Palestinians and the conflict. So we developed news stories as primes or reminders. And um, basically everybody heard at least two news pieces. One was about the high living costs in Israel. The other one was about um, traffic accidents in Israel. Both of these are non-group related, uh, non-Palestinian related um, themes that are pretty important to Israelis because they're, pr they're negative and something that needs to be corrected. Uh, so they would start, the interviews would begin with these two uh, paragraphs, news pieces, and then you would get um, a question, how important is this issue to you? Then there would be a third article in at least two conditions, a third article that would either talk about nonviolent protest or violent protest. In the control condition, there was no third article. It was just these articles about uh, Israeli life. The nonviolent and violent protest articles were written to match protests that have actually occurred in places like Budrus and Berlin, and they were also matched for levels of sacrifice. So what do I mean by that? Um, what we tried to depict was the normal scenario of a group of people who come regularly, who um, may sit in front of a tree, 
that is about to be bulldozed, who uh, won't leave when the soldiers tell them to, but who are not using violence. So they're not throwing stones, they're not doing anything. So again, we're matching for what has been reported on already in the news. Um, the violent protest articles have a similar structure and word length, um, but the difference is violence is used within the protests. Again, all articles have the same word count, whether it be the non-protest articles or the protest articles. Okay, so here's an example of the nonviolent protest prime. Uh, again, it was written to resemble the protests that were ongoing, so there was no reference to a specific date or place or time. And it begins, as you may know, some Palestinians in the West Bank have been peacefully protesting against the positioning of the security fence, which has taken away the lands and fields of many Palestinian villages. Every week and sometimes every day, these Palestinians walk to the side of the fence and try to reach their lost lands. Some tie themselves to bulldozers. One of their leaders says, we have chosen another way to protest nonviolently to carry a message of hope and real partnership between Palestinians and Israelis in the face of oppression and injustice. So an example of the violent protest um, begins similarly and has the same structure, but there are, uh, as you'll note, significant differences. As you may know, some Palestinians in the West Bank have been violently protesting against the positioning of the security fence. Every week, and sometimes every day, these militants plan and carry out acts of violence to confront the army, halt construction on the fence, and try to free the lost lands. And then we, we always noted something that a leader says. One of their leaders says, if land is occupied, Muslims have a right and a duty to resist that occupation, and military occupation is rightly resisted militarily. As you can see, I left out a few sentences um, in the ellipses, but these were mostly, um, well, they were all controlled for again. We just wanted to focus on what was happening, what a leader would say to give sort of an ideolo ideological background that was either very peaceful or um, willing to use violence. And then at the end, both of them discussed the sacrifices that protesters had made. Okay, so we did the survey this past July, on the 26th and 27th, and just to give you a visual of the structure of the survey, it was a phone survey with 603 respondents that were randomly selected from a national phone list, 294 of whom were female, and um, the, the survey could take anywhere between 15 and 30 minutes. It began with the news primes, which was the reading of these two to three stories. Um, 200 of the subjects were in the control condition, 200 in the nonviolent protest condition, and 200 in the violent protest condition. After the news primes and after being asked how important those issues were to the respondents, uh, we went into a series of questions on group beliefs and then questions on trade-offs for peace, a few questions on sacred values, and lastly, demographics. Um, it's really important to talk about the political context at the time of the survey. So there were both Palestinian and external reminders of violence and continuation of conflict ongoing at that time. Um, anybody who wants to, we can spend more time on this slide later. Uh, for now, I think I'm going to move forward to the results. But uh, suffice it to say that there had been clashes in Gaza. Uh, in March, so a few months before the survey, um, there were rockets being sent into Israel for three days at that time. And then there was resulting uh, sort of civilian violence that was presumably related. In June, just one month, maybe actually a month and a half before the survey, an Israeli soldier was killed by a militant from Gaza who was trying to infiltrate. There were plans to build new settler homes, and, um, and then there was a goodwill gesture handing over the bodies of 91 Palestinian suicide bombers uh, as part of goodwill gesture to Abbas to revive the peace talks. So there were constant reminders of the conflict and violence were part of those reminders. Initially, uh, as many will recall, there were threats from Egypt and even deaths uh, related to that and Iran was also a big subject at the time. So security and violence um, definitely in the air during the time of the survey. Okay, so what did we expect? In terms of which prime would negatively impact 
outcomes, we sort of intuitively hypothesized that violence would lead to the most negative perceptions of Palestinians and the conflict, followed by the control condition where Palestinians weren't referenced at all, uh, since it's, it's sort of the status quo. We assumed that priming nonviolent protests would seem refreshing and hopeful, and would therefore lead respondents to be more positive about things like group change, Palestinians, prospects for peace, etc. And then we plan to test these hypotheses using contrasts. And these are basically statistical measures of significant differences between groups. Instead, we never found a positive impact from the nonviolent prime within the data. And we'll go into some details next. But we didn't even find trends or data patterns that were indicating a possible positive impact. So sometimes you just don't get significant differences, but you'll see a common pattern that leads in one direction. Basically, the nonviolent protest prime never led to a positive effect for any of our variables. And of course, this kind of floored us. Often, indeed, the nonviolent prime led to small but significant negative effects, um, and more so than both control and violent primes. Okay, so as I walk you through these examples, I just want to let you know that everything reported is statistically significant below a 5% um, probability. Um, this first question was, do you think there are any Palestinians who think Israelis should be killed just because they are Jews? If yes, what percentage of Palestinians do you think has this belief? Surprisingly, uh, reminders of nonviolent protests led to the highest estimations of the percentage of Palestinians who would support killing Israelis because of who they are rather than what they do. And frankly, that number is high. It's a little over 50 percent, uh, 55 percent. Moreover, violent Palestinian protests led to the lowest estimated percentage, um, although when I say that, you should keep in mind that the differences between the violent condition and the control condition where Palestinians were not referenced at all are not statistically significant. So this is more just a pattern. Um, that number is still high, by the way, because it's just over half of the population. So we were wondering what causes this, and we still don't know, and hope to brainstorm some of, some of this with you. But um, one thought was that it could be that reminders of both nonviolent protests and violent protests activate awareness of the opposite, um, the opposite known Palestinian representations, and that these drive the response. So if you tell me that there's this nonviolent protest going on, the first thing my mind does is say, oh, but that that's not all of them. I also know there's violence going on. And then when I answer the question, I'm thinking about the violence. Or if you tell me about a violent protest, I'm saying, yeah, but you know what? Not all Palestinians are like that. I know of these examples. And then I'm answering the question, thinking about the nonviolence. So this is just a conjecture. But it would explain why the control condition uh, was, you know, somewhat in the middle or between them. So here is another question within the group section. Um, that had surprising responses. Um, this was trying to gauge how Israelis perceive Palestinian intent, and the question was, do you think there are any Palestinians who believe that the goal of resistance is to see justice for Palestinians and not to kill Israelis? If yes, what percentage of Palestinians do you think has this belief? Here, in a question that characterized Palestinians as hating the political situation but not Israelis themselves, Nonviolent protest reminders led to the lowest estimate, about 39%. Uh, reminders of violent protest prompted a higher estimate, about 44%. And when nothing Palestinian was activated at all, the estimate grew to more than 47%. So again, we see that the hopeful or promising act of nonviolent protest engenders a perception more ne negative than no protest at all, and even more negative than Palestinian violence. Okay, um, so as I mentioned before, sovereignty over Jerusalem is considered a sacred value, or a value that won't be traded off on, for a subset of Israelis. Psychologists have shown that intergroup threat can create or rigidify sacred values, um, and so for that reason, again, we wanted to see if diffusing the threat might also soften um, views of, we call them absolutist Israelis, those who are taking a sacred value towards an issue such as Jerusalem, or compromises over the West Bank. So here the question was, do you agree that there are some extreme circumstances where it would be permissible for Israelis to consider sharing sovereignty over Jerusalem? No represents a sacred value because it's a refusal to compromise no matter what. 
And as you can see, reminders of nonviolent protests led to more no answers than did reminders of violent protest, or no Palestinian reminder at all. Here, although the difference between violent and control is not significant, um, violent protest had the most positive impact on softening stances on sovereignty. So that's similar to what we saw before. Um, okay, continuing. In this last question, we were interested in finding out what Israelis um, would think Palestinians would think and do as a result of actions they may take towards a peace agreement. So we looked at the issue of settlement freeze. And here, the question was, um, imagine that Israel unilaterally declared and implemented a freeze on settlement building and dismantled illegal settlement outposts. How do you think Palestinians would respond? Do you think Palestinians would see this as a triumph and use the victory to gather momentum for more act attacks against Israel? And um, one equals yes, two equals no. So again, we find that the nonviolent prime led to more yes answers, that Palestinians would view it as a triumph and then attack. Um, the violent condition led to fewer, um, and then control was somewhere in between. So we find this common pattern, which is, you know, a little, a little difficult. In summary, nonviolent protest reminders led to a small but statistically significant negative effects. Um, sometimes violence led to the least negative impact, which is surprising. And our thoughts were, again, that perhaps whenever confronted with a violent or nonviolent representation, respondents pull up opposite stories. Um, but it may also be that the scenario is just more familiar. So Israelis are really used to violence and, and used to expecting violence in the Palestinian conflict, and they've become used to thinking maybe telling themselves, well, they're not all like that, or just imagining peace prospects within that scenario. To, to imagine within a novel scenario, nonviolent protest, which, by the way, includes a lot of agency and, and unity in, the, in its um, depiction of Palestinians, it could be threatening. And a point on this, within the psychological literature, there is, um, there is a a case to be made for entitativity, that when we ourselves feel we are a unified group and we act as a unified group, um, we feel we have more agency, we feel more powerful, and we suspect that um, better outcomes will endure within an intergroup conflict. When the other side is seen to be entitative, when they are viewed as having agency and being unified, um, it tends to be perceived as a threat and as an obstacle to getting what you want. So there really could be something to this, that not only is nonviolent protest um, novel and a new situation in which Palestinians may not have, or sorry, which Israelis may not have ideas of what to do with, it also could be threatening. So of course the question is, what does this mean? Um, one thought that we had is that because Israeli uh, responses were across these different sections of our survey um, negative after nonviolent primes, it makes us think that there might be just a general psychological dampening having in, react in reaction to the nonviolent protest prime. So, so if you're used to violence, um, violence gives you a moral high ground. People are threatening your life. And which makes them both sub and superhuman, and you need to do whatever is necessary um, to protect yourself and, and create a safe status quo. If all of a sudden people are not threatening your life, they're in the realm of human again, and it takes away uh, sort of the moral superiority or justification that you might have for something like an occupation. It almost puts in your lap the responsibility to do something. Uh, to do something positive, to take steps forward, all things which would engender fear um, and may even seem impossible to an Israeli living in the current political context. So our thought was that this could be an emotional and implicit, almost automatic uh, distancing that occurs when reminded of Palestinian nonviolence. 
Um, and, you know, our plans are to pursue research which would help us flesh out that mechanism. But there's another possible interpretation of what happened with the survey, and that is that perhaps Israelis um, simply didn't believe the nonviolent story. So many Israelis have experience in the military, even, even if it was before nonviolent uh, protests were taking place uh, after 2000. Um, even if it was, you know, a long time ago, in their experience, they have seen protests become violent. There's been rock throwing. Every Israeli will cite somebody they know who died or was injured by a rock. Um, and often it can lead to even greater violence. So it's possible that when we primed with the news story of nonviolent protests, the reader or the listener in this case actually thought, oh, but it doesn't, it's, it's actually not true. That's not usually how it goes. Um, or it's possible that when we primed with the nonviolent protest stories, Israelis were thinking, well, that's great for that one group, but it's not how it is for uh, Hamas, um, who is still sending missiles to southern Israel. So this, this idea of parallel stories of violence can create an assumption of violence, uh, even when you have nonviolent protests going on in an organized and really successful manner. The other thing is lack of news coverage. So while nonviolent protests have been covered in the news and while Israelis are aware of them, they don't garner a lot of press. It's nothing like Egypt or the Arab Spring. Um, in fact, most we, we did a pre-survey where we asked people sort of what they knew about Palestinian nonviolence and, and nonviolent protest and you know versus the Arab Spring. Most Israelis were like, why don't they do something like Egypt? Um, so even though they knew these were going on, they didn't feel that it was like a holistic movement. And, you know, there's also truth to that. So the news coverage, I think, parallels those views, meaning that there is coverage when things happen, but it's, it's not viewing um, nonviolent protests within the Palestinian territories as something that is hugely entitative, to use the term I, I threw out there before. So it's not a mass agency. It might be something that's more particular to certain places. And in the mind of an Israeli, therefore, it doesn't represent the Palestinian cause um, en masse. So the other thing about lack of news coverage would be that um, it, there have been a lot of studies showing that behaviors and sometimes attitudes are more likely to change via norms. So when we see others from our group doing or believing something, we tend to do or believe that thing more than um, via information analysis. So, so even if we prime them with a news story about a protest that they know has been happening, um, if they don't find a lot of uh, material in the media about such protests, then they're probably not uh, thinking that other Israelis consider this to be a big thing, which means they may not take it seriously. Um, the other thing is just empathy, which transfers via media very quickly. Uh, it's easier to take perspective when you are standing in someone else's shoes and seeing an image of where they are and what they're doing allows you to do that. So there are these two possibilities. One is that our manipulation worked and in reaction to nonviolent protests, um, there really is this almost fear-based automatic distancing of um, Palestinians and their minds and needs and pursuits from the Israeli psyche. And the other is that um, you know, the story just doesn't seem real and so it doesn't get much um, internalization from Israelis. The one thing in response to this second uh, interpretation is that we did get variability on the answers. So to some extent, nonviolent protest uh, did matter, right? We did get differences between the conditions for these questions. So there's something going on here, but, uh, but disbelief of the story might also have a role in other questions. So what are the takeaways for this? Uh, everybody on this call is clearly interested in or dedicated to nonviolent protests and what it can accomplish in the world today. Uh, so what does this mean for people who not only think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but perhaps other conflicts? Well, one thing is that nonviolent protest does not automatically equal good in the eyes of its target. So in this case, um, 
where violence has a history and where it might even be operating in parallel with nonviolent protests, there could be what we're calling a cognitive or you could actually call an emotional lag before the other side changes its perception of the group. And that lag, like I mentioned before, might have something to do with an automatic distancing, like a, a fear and threat-based distancing um, to changes that, that change the level of moral superiority. There are, however, major problems with generalizing. So even if we follow up with the study and can show that this mechanism is at work, um, Places where there's not a long-standing history of violence or a co-occurring history of violence as a tactic in the conflict just may not suffer this, right? So if you're looking at, uh, for instance, Egypt, where there had been this status quo, violence was always in the hand of the government, um, but nowhere else, when the tables were turned, really a lot of people described that country as being as one against a certain government. Now today we can say the group divisions have grown and transformed, but at least at the onset when the, when the tactics were being used and, and successfully deposed a leader, there was the sense, you know, that a civilian in Tahrir Square would look at a soldier and they would be on the same side. Um, so violence or nonviolence uh, was new and was not competing at least at least in large-scale perception with violent tactics. And the other thing is that intergroup dynamics may be quite different than intergroup dynamics. So when it's a country revolting against its leader versus one nation against another nation, it's very possible that the way, our, a psychological way that we perceive in-groups and out-groups um, could influence how we how we internalize and perceive a nonviolent protest from the outgroup. So with that, um, I'm going to close, but like I said, this is our first presentation of data, and I'm really curious as to questions and thoughts um, about what could be going on here. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Nicole. So now we're going to go to the question and answer portion. One thing I think, Nicole, that would be interesting for a future discussion would be looking at how Palestinians themselves perceive mm -hmm. Palestinian violent versus nonviolent campaigns. So maybe for a future discussion. It's a great thought. In, in fact, it, is, it was our original plan to do both surveys at, at the same time, um, but for a bunch of design reasons, we decided to go one before the other and then and see what came of it. So, yeah, it's a great idea. Great. So um, we have a hand raised. Um, Dan, I'm going to unmute you now. You can go ahead with your question. Hi, excellent brief. Um, I'm wondering how much values, uh, their values shape uh, their, their sacred, uh, sacred values and through which, which lens they, they see the world and how this can influence their behavior. And if nonviolence is seen as something irresponsible or suicidal, um, especially when defending one's honor, that's all I have. Hmm. There's two thoughts in there that seem um, really worthy to me. We I didn't talk a lot about demographics in our survey, but we did ask questions about how religion and how strong one's beliefs were, how often they prayed, and how often they went publicly to a place of prayer or religious activity. Um, so we, have, we also have questions about who is living in settlements in the West Bank um, and who is in Israel proper, um, and then conservative and liberal, etc. So we have a few uh, covariates, I guess. We, we have a few questions which we can use to see how they impact um, answers to some of these questions. And I can tell you off the bat, I didn't present it here, but uh, liberal being, being more, we didn't use the term liberal, but being more left uh, or being more right definitely influences these questions and uh, where you live. So if you're living in a settlement, it of course led to different answers than if you were um, living in Israel proper. So, so your question is right on, that beliefs and values do impact um, how 
how one would view sacred values and how one would view the answers to some of these questions. Um, we didn't, however, find interactions with nonviolence. So we expected that when we would put, um, say, if you lived in a settlement or if you were really conservative, uh, alongside nonviolent versus violent, that we would see these things influence uh, people with these beliefs differently, and we didn't. So to your second question, which was, might nonviolent protest be perceived as weak, especially for someone who, who, if their value is sacred, they're willing to die for it. So if someone else wasn't willing to die for their value, um, you know, would you think lesser of them? Or if you thought that, you know, they're willing to die for something that's not effective, would you think lesser of them? We didn't, we didn't find in this survey any evidence of that. Next question, um, Nancy, please have your microphone ready. I really um, was intrigued by the presentation. I was wondering, uh, it seems to me that the language we use in our questions is extremely important. And I really felt it's possible that the language, if it's loaded, could skew the results. Um, and um, I also wasn't really sure of definitions of what is violence you know, what is considered to be violence, or is there a scale, like, of violence? Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I mean, you're 100% correct that how you frame questions influences the answers. And certainly when you're framing any questions for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's loaded. It's loaded, if it's not loaded for one group, it's loaded for the other. So our challenge was to design questions. Um, as, I, as I had mentioned to Jake, we are planning to do this survey on both sides of the green line. So our challenge was to design questions that could be neutral enough um, to garner the largest impact for both sides, right? Uh, so, so there's no way that you can write a question without offending somebody in Israel or in the Palestinian territories with these sorts of statements, even just bringing up the topic. We had some people who simply refused to answer questions about Palestinians, period. So, um, so it is super loaded. However, a lot of the questions that we did use in our questionnaire, we've used in past surveys, and are, they are the result of continuous honing and focus groups and feedback. Um, so. So I guess I'm saying to you two things. Number one, yes, uh, you have to be really careful about loaded questions because they can skew answers. And number two, uh, we, we did our best. You might be referring in particular to the news stories because I think um, that's where at least we had, it's, it was a novel introduction to the survey for us and we had to think really carefully about how much detail. You have to go into some detail in order to conjure, conjure an image in someone's mind, um, but then doing it in a way that can be balanced and won't be, um, what's, a, what's a good word, won't lead to uh, unnecessarily emotional reaction is the goal. So for the violent Palestinian protest, um, how did we talk about it? We wanted to give detail without, um, but, but also be generic. So we wanted people to sort of, well, here's what we said. Um, as you may know, some Palestinians in the West Bank have been violently protesting at the positioning of the fence, yada, yada. Um, Palestinian residents of these villages have made an important choice to use physical resistance, including violence, to oppose a position of the fence. So that was in contrast to the nonviolent protest um, sentence, which said Palestinian residents of these villages have made an important choice to use um, physical resistance, but only peaceful methods to oppose the position of the fence. And then in terms of giving details, which was the next paragraph where we wanted to conjure images, Every week and sometimes every day, this is the violent one again, um, these militants plan and carry out acts of violence to confront the army, halt construction of the fence, and try to free the lost land. In places where the work is completed, the militants try to destroy or tunnel under the wall or the fence, attacking soldiers who guard it. And that's all we said. 
so we took that from, we, we reviewed stories of protests and what had been done that was violent amidst the protests, and that was what came out. Um, and so that's what we referenced, because we definitely wanted only to activate things that had been in the press. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, you know, if that's loaded or not, I think referencing violence, period, is loaded for Israelis. Uh, and that's part of what we're looking at. If those loadings would influence how they perceive Palestinians, I think the shock here is that even with activating violence, with all of the loadedness that it may entail, we had more positive perceptions of Palestinians than, than when we activate nonviolent protests. So I, I hope that answered your question a little bit. But you can write to me if you have more specific ideas. Thank you. Um, we have quite a few more questions. I see Noreen and Sarit have your hands raised. So we'll get to those in a minute. Also some in the writ written in questions from Frankie Austin and a few others. Um, but there's a question I wanted to ask you um, that's kind of a synthesis of my own question and my colleague, Dr. Barkowski, who's also listening, which is, um, based on your findings, if, if these nonviolent campaigns to actually change create a negative perception, uh, what do you think are some of the takeaways for Palestinians that are involved in a civil resistance campaign to have the reverse effect? Um, so are, are there any strategic lessons that can be taken away from this um, in terms of do they continue using the same tactics and strategies or do they need to shift the conduct? And just kind of as an add-on, you mentioned that um, when people are engaged in a nonviolent campaign, it takes away this uh, dehumanization that can happen that is often required for groups engaged in a military campaign. So what do you think would be the lesson in order to have the reverse effect to connotate nonviolent struggle with positive perceptions? I think that is the golden question. And um, I have some ideas, but I would, of course, uh, I want to emphasize that I don't know, that, that we don't know, and that would, you know, in order to confidently and scientifically say, what I would want to do actually is interview some of the soldiers who have been in the successfully nonviolent protests to see, for instance, did their responses on this type of survey mirror, um, mirror what we found in terms of averages? Or were they changed by the literal experience of, um, of seeing these people, looking in their eyes, understanding what they were doing, respecting them for um, you know, staying together and not resorting to violence when things get hard, et cetera. I think, I think interviews and sort of in-depth um, discussions could be helpful. And in particular with soldiers versus a population that may not be as exposed to what's going on, right? Um, so to answer your question of what should they do, first of all, this is a one-shot survey looking at reactions um, in a population where, as I mentioned, the media has not focused on these protests in particular, where a lot of Israelis don't think that these protests are what led to the Israeli Supreme Court rerouting the wall. Um, where in the Israeli mind, at least, it's not clear that other Israeli minds think this is significant. Um, so I would say that Palestinian protesters don't need to change so much. I was really impressed, like the Navi um, taking on the costumes and being creative. And if you watch Budris or any of these upcoming documentaries uh, that are up for Oscars, you know, it's really impressive what is going on out there, and I, I don't think that it should be changed. I think what needs to change is Israeli awareness of it and interaction with it. So more, uh, the more Israelis that become involved and meet these Palestinians, um, potentially the more changes will be made. And in terms of, since obviously those Israelis would be self-selecting, they'll tend to be liberal, et cetera, in, in terms of media, getting, getting the images and the stories out, that, I don't know. That, I guess, I would want to talk to somebody who's a media specialist about, is how do you do it. And, and my somewhat non-optimistic answer is, 
that media takes its cues from political possibility. So if we were to see cues from the top, literally from the Netanyahu government, um, that Palestinians were being taken seriously and that nonviolent um, protest was leaving an impact, um, I bet you there would be more media coverage and different, more qualitative media coverage, which then might engender responses amongst Israelis. But I'll keep thinking about that question, Jake, because because it is it is really important, and maybe there are things that Palestinians could do um, that I haven't really thought a lot about yet. Absolutely, yeah. That's kind of you can't really draw that absolute conclusion from from this kind of study. So I just wanted to hear your some thoughts on that. Our next question is Noreen. Um, Noreen, you are now unmuted. Okay, thanks. Um, so I have more of a comment and a question. You talked about um, the crystallization of consensus and how that could work in changing um, Israeli perception of the nonviolent project. So whatever is um, whatever is in the media, in the Israeli media, um, if someone, you know, if they report about these nonviolent protests or if more people uh, believe in it, then, you know, they would um, actually orient themselves to take nonviolent protests, protests seriously. Um, I just want to ask your thoughts regarding um, a possible solution could be that nonviolent nonviolence protests on the part of Palestinians relies uh, largely on global non-silence. Um, I feel like if more people, you know, because we can't just keep talking about the media, I, it definitely the political um, aspects of the media is tr um, important and we should take note of it. But, you know, there are other platforms that we can consider, you know, Facebook and all that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on, you know, us relying on global non-silence as an alternative to um, reorienting Israeli perceptions on um, the nonviolence protest? I mean, absolutely, right? I, I think that any form of media possible, uh, getting the word out, voices being heard, images being seen, all of it is useful, right? Um, and I think it's a, it's a double-edged sword. I'm not sure how much international attention to the issue would change Israeli perceptions in the manner that we've been measuring here in the way that we want. And, and why do I say that? Because, again, so much happens um, in terms of perceptions. So much of what feeds into them is based on uh, feeling threatened versus choosing it yourself, right? So if you see people paying attention and giving respect to something within your own group, um, you tend to also give respect to something and pay attention to it. But if other people are sort of damning you in a way by telling you, you know, how can you not be uh, reacting to this? Why aren't you engaging this? You know, what it, it sort of goes to that moral superiority inferiority thing again, where all of a sudden it's like, oh, you're saying this is my fault now, that I'm responsible for whatever, and, there, and you might get a, a distancing reaction again. Again, this is conjecture, but I think um, I think, number one, yes, absolutely, all, all forms of social media and um, international media are important and good. Um, and, and this also goes to Jake's question, what I'm about to say here. I, I to some degree, am not um, depressed about these findings, and here's why. At first, of course, you're like, what? I can't believe this. And then we're thinking... If anything, this kind of study should just say, if things aren't changing, there are psychological barriers you should be aware of and just keep pressing because they can't stay like that forever. And I, what I would really like to do is spend hours with Gene Sharp's books going through, especially the Dynamics book, um, to, to see if there are clues in there uh, based on all his studies as to when you pass the, the threshold. Because people can only for so long see a nonviolent protests and movement um, and ignore it or distance it, right? At some point you have to say, this, is, this has been going on and now it's in my backyard and what am I going to do about it? So I think the point with this is that in very certain um, conditions, in, in certain cases, we should not expect there's an immediate change by how the other views us. 
right? And, and those conditions specifically are when violence is being used alongside nonviolent tactics. And, and it doesn't mean stop. It doesn't mean that you should do better. It just means that in the minds of the person you're trying to influence, there's a lot of confusion. And there's a lot of questions like, does, would this mean I'm to blame or not? And as long as violence is co-occurring, that person is not going to come to, to a decision that, oh, yeah, it's on me, right? They're still under threat. This next one um, comes from the written-in questions. Kind of a nice transition from the last one. It comes from Frankie, um, who asks, did you get a sense of how much so, sort of an idea of battle weariness might affect both sides? Or the ability to engage nonviolent protests and the perception of nonviolent protests? Do you think they might be just tired and locked into old psychological habits or norms? Um, and this comes from him as a combatant political activist in the Northern Ireland conflict. Mm. That's a great question. Um, our study didn't, you know, we didn't have a question that could measure how conflict fatigued are you. Um, but I think, as, as you are well aware, based off your own long-running conflict, anybody who lives, Israeli or Palestinian, uh, anyone who lives in the region, even those who, are, who leave, are tired, right? Deeply, deeply tired and I think pessimistic about how to get out of this conflict or if it could ever be f fixed. Um, the, the, so that's hard and that's sad and yet we have seen times in history when people who think it's not going to change um, and are conflict fatigued are re-energized. So Sadat comes to the Knesset and gives a speech which you know changes relations between Israel and Egypt um, and, and all of a sudden you get a peace and there are opportunities for leadership and I think increasingly for the people uh, who show themselves to be as powerful as leadership to re-energize um, the participants, the majorities on both sides of the green line um, Getting that to happen, that's, that's the, the major question. And, and how, you, how you get people to take those risks, um, that would be the major question. So do I think it influenced the study? Because that's a little different. I am not sure that it did, because presumably we would, it, it was a randomly selected sample, and presumably people are tired all across the Israeli society. And so if we had 200 in each group, um, we saw the same effects, right? We still got differences between the nonviolent and violent uh, protest primes. So even if they're tired, we still see effects. That was a great question. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so I'm going to go to Sarit. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Thank you so much. This is uh, so interesting. Um, I guess I have, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in the field of uh, political philosophy, but I have a question from the field of sociology. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a comment and not a question. I, I'll try and form it as a question. <laughs> no worries. Um, so to a certain degree, it seems to me that when you give a prime like that, the resonance of this prime with the general narrative of the society it's being released in, is uh, very important. And what do I mean? You mentioned Sadat, for example. Sadat uh, could make peace with Begin after the big, you know, change in 77. And Begin was a military man. So um, force and uh, military-oriented uh, military personnel are very highly appreciated in Israel. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a general narrative that I, seems to me it's not a research that I have done, but I look at it and I'm trying to um, make an educated guess. And I think, so that's the first thing that I'm, I'm wondering about. I'm wondering about the resonance of nonviolent action in general in this kind of space that is so military-oriented, in which the, 
the army is so um, is appreci is almost a sacred uh, value. It's not a sacred value, but it it is almost one. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that came to mind, and I was wondering if it needs to be controlled for, like when we are comparing it to other nonviolent efforts in other countries that have different mm. um, kind of uh, perceptions of politicians. Uh, for example, the U.S. Okay, where being educated and having a degree and going to Harvard counts more than being in the army and being a general and mm -hmm. something like that. Um, so that that's one thing that I was wondering about. And the second thing I was wondering, and I really don't know if it's not true that all nonviolent, or maybe most, all is a bit, that many nonviolent movements are at first uh, perceived as uh, not serious. Mm -hmm. If it's not something that because nonviolent movements really need to um, become very big in order to count. So you see the civil yeah. rights movement, and you see Gandhi, and okay. So it needs to become really big to count. If it's not really big, it many times can be chalked down to nice try, that was a nice moment, etc., etc. You can see it in the social justice movement in Israel two years ago, when only when it started to gain numbers did people start looking at it as a real game changer. But it took a while. At first, they were made fun of. So maybe efforts like Budrus, and maybe size matters here a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe the numbers count a little bit. And I'm wondering if there's any research that you're aware of, of you know, the chronological factor of when a movement, chronological and size factor of when a movement is starting to be taken more seriously. Great questions. Um, I'm going to start with the second one because I think it's a, it's a more direct answer. We were interested in sort of the process, and that's one reason why we, we kept thinking, you know, nobody's really looking at how nonviolent protest is affecting um, the target players, and we have a, we have a lot of assumptions. Um, there is discussion about how it affects soldiers or the military within a, a country when you're trying to overthrow a leader, but less so in the intergroup context. So we wanted to get at that, like what is the process, and I think to some extent this survey um, uh, when it's published, its contribution will be to say that part of the process is to not immediately bowl over your opponent. Um, you don't immediately change the status quo or expectations, etc., within a conflict uh, by taking on these tactics. You should expect it to take a while. Um, and that's good to know in advance, right? In terms of when, when the snowball thresholds um, I don't have an answer to that. Somebody else who is in the audience today might have one, but I certainly concur that large numbers seem to matter. And this gets at, at that psychological concept of entitivity that I was talking about earlier. The studies are very clear on this, that when the other group is perceived to be unified and um, an and agent, when they are um, you know, making gains and seen as one entity, um, they're seen to be powerful and a force to reckon with. So the fact that nonviolent protest has not snowballed more, um, has not snowballed beyond just these communities trying to save their villages from the wall and into like a larger political force, um, I think, you know, ostensibly and importantly overcoming violence, I think that that is the real problem uh, for Palestinians. And that might explain these answers. Uh, but to your question as to exactly what number that occurs at, and you know, I, I don't know. But if someone else wants to comment, um, please. And then to your first question about how military is almost a sacred value for Israelis. I mean, it's, it certainly does structure society, and it's a part of everyone's life. And importantly, military service is when best friendships are formed. Um, you learn your own medal. Uh, in terms of you know what you can resist and handle, um, it's a time when you thought you were going to die and then you survive. These are like the most impressionable identity formation moments of people's lives, and um, and military networks remain with you all all the way through your life in Israel. So absolutely, I think that to, to some degree it is it is a sacred value um, beyond just the fact that it's military. It's also it's like family and friends and um, and meaning which is security. So that's true. It may be that that makes this case unique. It may be one more thing that makes this case unique. However, 
I have heard interviews and documentaries with um, soldiers who have been at, at some of these successful protests who were really influenced, who did start to see things differently. And clearly you have, you know, um, Israeli activists who are protesting with people in Berlin and other communities um, who have been transformed by what's going on. So even though they too have that military background and are affected by it, they have been changed by the experience. So, so I think it may make Israel unique, it might make the threshold take longer, all of those things, but on the other hand, it might actually contribute to a greater respect. If you hold the gun and are used to that power and somebody is going to like really risk their life um, to sit in front of you and not move, I would think you'd be shaken. Uh, and I think, the, I think the question here is maybe you are shaken and maybe that's what's so troubling and, and causes the distancing for Israelis because it would mean that this, this really big and important source of power wouldn't have the same power uh, that one had always thought. On top of the moral superiority thing, um, this, this could be in effect. But these are all conjectures. Really great question and response. That, that first part definitely gets to the heart of campaign building and mobilization and thinking about what makes a civil resistance campaign successful. Um, so yeah, and that's actually something that you would learn about if you were to attend the Fletcher Summer Institute. <laughs> so uh, feel free to apply to that if you're interested in learning more. Um, we're, we're 12 minutes over, so unfortunately we, we won't be able to get to the final questions. I see Marinetta, Austin, Spencer, uh, Leah, Tori, and Paul. Um, I will take your questions and forward them to Nicole, and hopefully she'll be able to respond when she has a chance. If anyone else has a question that you would like to ask, that you just think of after, after the fact, um, please feel free to email it to us. Um, I'm going to put up our email address right now. So you can email that to webinar at nonviolent-conflict.org. And before we wrap up, um, I want to give you a chance, Nicole, if you have any final comments or takeaways or anything else you wanted to mention before we finish. Um. You know what, definitely to say thank you to everybody, and, and I really would welcome questions or comments um, if you send them to ICNC. Uh, I think they'll forward them on here. Any thinking in, on this matter will be helpful to us because you know we get now the privilege of writing this up and framing it and probably doing a little more research um, to give it a context. So, so thank you for those who have already um, participated and um, if anyone still wants to we welcome it and then secondly I um, I just want to emphasize that if anything for activists and organizers out there I think this can be a positive I mean I don't think it's any news to anybody who's been active in nonviolent protests in Israel and Palestinian context that uh, that it you know it's not necessarily bowling over the population um, so at least this tells us uh, where it's not, like which questions had the negative impacts um, and will help us get to why it's not. And in the meantime, I think, I think the answer is organize doubly hard and, and keep up the presence where it is, but get cross-sectional uh, members of society involved. And, um, and, and, you know, these guys know the tactics better than I do, but I think the answer is we need more Palestinians um, organizing nonviolently for change, and we need to influence the Palestinian government that way, and we mostly, frankly, need to influence Hamas and the other factions. Um, and I do think that can be done from my days in Gaza, um, knowing some people from from Hamas and others, I think there are ways to make inroads and, and I would say that's the direction it should be taken because once it does reach that number, there's no way that Israelis won't be paying attention.
thank you, Nicole. These are some, some definitely some things that uh, people engaged on both sides of the conflict should keep in mind. Some very interesting research. Um, so, Nicole, uh, thank you so much for your for your very interesting presentation. Thank you, Jake. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>